Hi, I'm Jill Bolduc and welcome to my video on the bacterial cell envelope. In this video, I'll describe the cellular components that are found in the bacterial cell membrane, as well as those that are found in a gram-positive, gram-negative, and acid-fast cell wall. Let's start by defining the term cell envelope. The envelope is the combination of the cell membrane and the cell wall. The bacterial cell membrane component of the envelope is pretty much the same for all bacterial cells. Like that of the eukaryotic cells, the bacterial cell membrane is a semi-permeable barrier that determines what can enter and what cannot, as well as what can exit and stays what remains inside the cell. Lastly, it defines the, cellulars, the cellular limits. Its major components in bacteria are the phospholipids, proteins, and the hopanoids. The phospholipids have a hydrophobic head that is ester linked to two hydrophobic fatty acid tails. As a side note, ester linkages are also found on all eukaryotic cells, uh, eukaryotic phospholipids, but not in the archaea phospholipids. Archaea phospholipids will have an ether linkage. More on this when I discuss the archaea in a separate video. The hydrophobic fatty acid tails can be saturated or unsaturated, but they're never branched. The kinks in the unsaturated tails allow for more spacing between the neighboring phospholipids and allow membrane fluidity and diffusion of small hydrophobic molecules across the cell membranes. The proteins make the cell membranes more functional, such that they act as receptors that bind to external membrane molecules, some have enzymatic functions to help build the cell wall, digest large molecules, and help internalize smaller nutrients, or they can also break down chemicals that are toxic for the cells. In addition, some of these proteins are transmembrane proteins, such that they span the entire width of the membrane and help transport large hydropho hydrophilic molecules in and out of the cell. The hoponoids. They act as like cholesterol that we have in our cells. They help maintain membrane fluidity and play a role in cell membrane permeability, especially under extreme conditions. A cell wall has two major roles. The first one is for the fact that the cell wall is a very rigid structure. It's going to add strength to the cell and it's going to protect it from bursting in a hypotonic environment. A good example of a hypertonic environment is pure water. A cell that doesn't have a cell wall will burst open or lyse, the process is called lysis, when too much water or solvent enters the cell. You might recall that the word tenacity refers to the solute concentration outside a cell in relationship to the concentration found inside the cell. Thus, if a cell is in an isotonic solution, that means that the, outside, the environment outside the cell has the same concentration of solute as is found inside the cell. Likewise, water or the solvent concentrations are also equal. So remember that osmosis is going to be the net movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane, like that of the cell membrane. And it's the direction of the direction of the water will flow from high to low concentration. In an isotonic solution, that net movement of water across the membrane is zero. That means it's at equilibrium. A bacterial cell will easily grow and replicate in an isotonic solution as long as all other essential conditions are met, including the right amount of nutrients. However, some cells are found in a hypotonic environment. Remember that hypo means that there is less solute outside the cell than there is inside the cell. And the inverse is true for the, for the solvent or water. Aquatic bacteria live in a hypotonic environment, so without a cell wall, osmosis will lyse the cells because of an uncontrollable movement of water inside the cells. But, because bacteria have a rigid cell wall surrounding their cells, only so much water can enter the cells until the membranes are pressed against the cell membrane, the cell walls, stopping osmosis from occurring and thus preventing lysis. 
The cell continues to grow and replicate as long as the cell wall is intact. Sometimes a bacterial cell might find itself in a hypertonic environment. That's where there's less water outside the cell compared to that inside the cell. In this case, water moves out of the cell until equilibrium can be reached. As water leaves the cell, the cell membrane pulls away from the cell wall, reducing the overall cell volume. If that hypertonic solution is too great, the water concentration inside the cell will reach a critical level that the cell cannot function and will ultimately die. This phenomenon is known as plasmolysis and will occur in cells uh, with or without cell walls. You might want to pause this video at this point to ensure that you fully understand the terms iso, hypo, and hypertonic and how they relate to the overall movement of water inside and outside of cells, particularly bacterial cells. Okay, so the second role that a cell wall uh, provides to the cell is the shape. So it helps determine the shape of each bacterial cell. Now keep in mind that bacteria assemble and repair their cell walls in different ways that are not completely understood. And also keep in mind that in order for cells to grow or expand, as well as replicate, which means dividing into two smaller cells, the cell wall needs to constantly be assembled, disassembled, and reassembled. I'll discuss bacterial replication by binary fission in more details in a separate video. But for now, these differences during cell wall synthesis will determine if the cell becomes a coccus, a coccobacilli, or a bacillus, and will also determine if that bacillus is straight or curved like the vibrio, spirillium, and spirochete. Cells without a cell wall are going to be amorphic. They're not going to have a, determined, a predetermined shape. So they won't have a fixed shape. An example of an amorphic cell are the bacteria known as mycoplasma. Mycoplasma do not have a cell wall. They're going to live inside a host cell that will help them maintain their constant isotonic environment that they need to grow in. Okay, so regardless of the type of cell wall that, the bacteria, that a bacterial cell will have, they will all contain the polysaccharide that is unique and known as peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is only found in bacteria. This is very important because it's going to be a target used for antibacterial comp components such as antibiotics. I'll say more about peptidoglycan in my video on antibiotics. Peptidoglycan is going to consist of the monomeric sugars known as N-acetyl glucosamine or NAG, N-A-G, and N-acetylmuramic acid, N-A-M, NAM. NAM is going to be covalently linked to a pentapeptide, five amino acids. This sequence of the five amino acids will vary between different species of, of bacteria, but they will all end in two D-alanines. The only exception, is the final D-alanine is replaced by D-lactate. Now the two sugars, NAG and NAM, are made inside the cell and then are transported to the cell membrane by the molecule Bactoprenol, where they will be covalently linked to each other before being transported across the membrane and outside the cell. The next important factor in making peptidoglycan or, or covalently linking these disaccharides together is, are the molecules known as penicillin binding proteins. We sometimes refer the, to them as PBPs. PBPs or penicillin binding proteins were first discovered by their ability to bind to penicillins. However, they're going to have multi-enzymatic functions. First function is that of glycosyl transferase or GT. What happens is when the disaccharides, the NAG and NAM disaccharides, are exported outside the cells, the penicillin binding proteins will extend to these disaccharides and covalently link them together. The resulting is a backbone of NAG and NAMs, which is the glycan portion, with the amino acid sequences, which is known as the peptide portion. So therefore, this is a strand of peptidoglycan. 
all cell walls, all bacteria with a cell wall will have various amounts of this peptidoglycan layer. Now, a single peptidoglycan strand such as this is not strong enough to add rigidity to a cell wall or to the cell. So therefore, we're going to have to covalently link them together. If not, they will simply just slip away as soon as they are exported outside the cell. So to do this, we're going to need the help of the penicillin binding proteins again. In this case, the penicillin binding proteins are going to have transpeptidase activity, TP. They will bind to the, to the, poly, uh, the pentapeptides. They will cleave the terminal dealanine uh, residue from the peptide chain and then link the pentapeptides, which is now four amino acids long, therefore covalently linking the strands of peptidoglycan together. Now peptidoglycan is a very strong molecule. Once the polypeptide strands are linked to each other, they're no longer able to slip away from the cell, the external part of the cell, and they basically encase the cell, forming a strong, rigid, protective layer. One group of bacteria, of bacteria that have a cell wall made of several layers of peptidoglycan are called the gram-positive bacteria. This name comes from the Danish bacteriologist named Hans Christian Gram, who developed a method of staining bacteria so that they become more visible under the microscope. Without getting into the mechanics of Gram staining, all the bacteria that stain purple or blue by this method have a thick peptidoglycan layer and are said to be Gram positive. Included in this thick peptidoglycan layer are the wall tachoic acids, which are covalently linked to the peptidoglycans NAM polysaccharide, or NAM monosaccharide, I should say. They will also have lipotechoic acids, which are anchored to the cell membrane by the glycolipid moiety. The tachoic acids are linear polymers of alternating phosphate and glycerol subunits, or phosphate ribotol subunits, and a few amino acids and saccharides. Both the lipotechoic acids and the waltachoic acids are anionic polymers because they, all, they both have that phosphate group which has a negative charge. Their functions aren't completely understood, but what we know so far is this. Cell walls that do not have a waltachoic acid grow slower than those that do. If the cell is rod-shaped without waltachoic acids, they become more spherical, and the dividing septum position is defective. Likewise, all those cells that uh, lack a lipotechoic acids, they appear to have less stability in membrane homeostasis and membrane function. So all this suggests is that the waltachoic acids are needed for correct cell wall elongation and division, and that the lipotechoic acids are important for the membrane function. What is known is that both the waltachoic acids and lipotechoic acids, uh, they do extend past the peptidoglycan layer and bind to metal cations. These metal cations and protons are very important uh, as cofactors to make en certain enzymes functional. So manganese, magnesium, calcium are often present in very low amounts in their environments. So the lipotechoic acids and waltachoic acids act as scavengers. They bind to all to all the anions, or I should say cations, that are present in their environment. While all the bacteria that contain, that contain a gram-positive cell wall stain purple, shown here on the left, a few of them will stain pink or red. These are called gram-negatives. These bacteria, uh, these bacterial cell walls will have a very thin peptidoglycan layer. Um, their layer, just for comparison, are 7 to nanometers thick compared to that of the gram-positive peptidoglycan layer, which is 20 to 80 nanometers thick. Now on the exterior side of this thin peptidoglycan layer, gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane layer. 
This outer membrane layer is composed of phospholipids on, the, on its inner side, similar to that of the cell membrane. However, the outer layer has uh, lipopolysaccharides embedded in its membrane, also known as LPS or endotoxins. A closer look at the LPS shows that the structure is made out of hexose sugars, fatty acid chains, and some amino acids. The structure is typically divided into three, uh, three main subunits. The first innermost subunit is called the lipid A region. Now this region is important because it has toxic effects on the bacterial host. That means us. So if we get infected with a gram-negative bacteria, we will develop uh, a, a fever, diarrhea, and sometimes some fatal shock. Hence the name of lipopolysaccharides is also known as endotoxin. The second region is the core region. It's composed of short chains of sugars, which may also contain some amino acids. And finally, on the exterior portion is the O antigen region. This region is a repetitive region that varies from strain to strain and is very immunogenic. That means that we develop a lot of antibodies to it. Now, in addition, LPS serves to protect the bacterial cell from harmful chemicals and increases its overall negative charge. So if you recall of tachoic acids and lipotachoic acids, they have a negative charge because they're phosphate groups, and that helps scavenge cations. So it's possible that the LPS has similar function. But it's also important to the health of a gram-negative bacteria, such that if the cell stops making lipopolysaccharides, it would soon die. Now, besides having LPS, the outer membrane also has porins. These porins are proteins that stack together and span the membrane, allowing certain molecules such as sugars, ions, and amino acids to cross the outer membrane and enter uh, and reach the peptidoglycan layer and then ultimately reach the cell membrane. A gram-negative outer membrane will have different porins that will allow the passive diffusion of specific molecules across the outer membrane layer, but at the same time prevent larger toxic molecules or chemicals from reaching the cell membrane. Between the outer membrane and the cell, the cell membrane is a space that we call the periplasmic space. Notice that the peptidoglycan layer is found within this space. So, because gram-positive bacterial cell envelopes do not have an outer membrane, this periplasmic space is unique to that of gram-negative bacteria. As you can see on the left, that the gram-positive bacteria do have a space between their cell membrane and the peptidoglycan layer. However, because there's no outer membrane, it is not called a periplasmic space. The third type of cell envelope that's going to be discussed in this video are known as the acid fast cell envelope. The reason why they are acid fast is because they contain the molecule called mycolic acid in their cell wall. The relevance of identifying acid fast bacteria is because all the bacteria that have an acid fast cell wall are associated with disease. That means that they cause infection. If you were to stain an acid fast bacteria using the gram staining technique, you would have a faint blue or purple cell. That's because the cells don't hold on to the dyes very easily. And upon examination though, the cell wall structure is neither that of a gram positive nor a gram negative bacteria. Thus, a different type of staining technique was devised to differentiate between bacteria that are resistant to decolorizing by acids, hence the name acid fast. Now, an acid fast cell wall has a similarity to that of a gram negative bacterial cell wall, such that it has a very thin peptidoglycan layer. However, the similarities end there. Besides having this thin layer peptidoglycan, they also have lipoarabinomannan. Lipoarabinomannan help inactivate the host macrophage which will then help spread the bacteria to different parts of the host during an infection. As mentioned, the cell wall has mycolic acid, which helps form the major component of the acid-fast cell wall 
It protects the bacteria from chemical damage, dehydration, and certain antibiotics. Within the cell wall, there are also porins, which have similar functions to those found in the gram-negative cell walls. Lastly, they also have acyl lipids, which contribute to the overall protection against the penetration of harmful chemicals. So there you have the three major type of cell walls found in bacterial cells. In summary, the bacterial cell envelopes are complex and can be grouped into three major groups. The various components help protect the bacterial cell from harm, while aiding to grow and replicate in a wide range of environmental conditions. The major component found in all three type of cell walls is that of known as peptidoglycan. This is going to be an important component when studying infectious diseases and is a major target for antibiotic therapy. While the majority of bacteria are either gram-positive or gram-negative, there is a small percentage of bacteria that are classified as being acid-fast positive, with an even smaller number of bacteria that don't have a cell wall at all. By classifying bacteria by, based on their cell envelopes or cell walls, it will help the healthcare providers treat bacterial infections depending on whether they are gram-positive, gram-negative, or acid-fast. They do interact differently with antibiotics. The cell wall classification is also the first step used in, by many microbiologists to discover how bacteria can improve our lives. So this concludes my video on bacterial cell envelopes. This slide shows a few of the terms that I presented in my, in my video. And so with this, I'd like to say thank you for listening and hope to see you with my other videos.